So, um, Steve, can you give us a little context? We're going to be talking about busing in Boston, and I understand that you were there for the very beginning for your entire high school um, experience, but can you start with where you were in elementary school? Sure, yeah. I actually went to a Catholic school, St. Anthony's in Alston, and uh, had to wear the uniforms, the white shirt and the clip-on neckties, and teachers were nuns. And uh, uh, Was the school racially mixed? No, no. What was it? It was pretty much all white kids. And then junior high? Junior high, I transferred to the Boston Public School System and went to the William Howard Taft Junior High School in Brighton. And there was very much race, racially integrated. Um, and that was going from one extreme to the other, uh, switching from St. Anthony's to that school. Was that hard to get used to? Yeah. Were there racial tensions at the time in junior high there before was. busing? Yeah, there was. There was. It was um, somewhat of an introductory to my high school years, um, which began in 1974, which was the first year of the forced busing. And um, I went to Hyde Park High because it was just mainly convenience was the reason that I went there because I, I was a white kid living in Mattapan right next to Hyde Park and I could take the public bus, the public T bus that went up River Street to get to school. And so your first day of school, of high school, the buses arrived for the first time anywhere in the country? Is that all the school buses that brought all the black kids in, yeah, and to me, it was just like, okay, let's give this a shot. Um, it, they all piled out of the buses, and it, to me, it was like, okay, fine. I mean, I, I had a taste of this at uh, Taft Junior High School already, and uh, let's see how this goes. <laughs> and how did it go? Uh, not so well. <laughs> um, there was always racial tension um, throughout the school, and for the most part, some kids tried to do what they could with it and uh, still, you know, try to get an education, um, but the, the most uh, troubling times was when classrooms, when classes ended and everybody had to, you know, walk the hallways to the next class. The bell rang. The bell rang, yeah. And, and pe all the kids were walking down the hallways, even though there was hall monitors all over, around every corner. That was when all the conflict seemed to bubble up and, and fights would happen that would, would and could spread like wildfire. Sometimes they were they were hushed and shut down quick, but other times word got out that, the, that it had happened and, you know, there would be like a ripple effect. So they'd be fighting in all many hallways at the same time? Yeah, it could, it was, it like wow. became the norm. It, it became like a commonplace thing. So you were always, you know, watching out for that. And it was, it became such a distraction Good question. It's the, it, a lot of it really didn't make sense to me. It was just like the way, the way some white kid looked at a black kid or vice versa. Or, you know, you'd be walking and they would either intentionally or unintentionally bump into each other, you know, walking in opposite directions in order to trigger the conflict. You know, it was, you never knew where it came from or when it was going to happen. But it sure happened. Did fights break out in the classrooms as well as out in the hallways? Uh, sometimes I was involved in one once that um, I remember the guy, uh, I don't want to say his name, but uh, I do remember it. But this black kid decided he wanted to um, 
he wanted to take a book off of my desk as he was walking down the aisle and bring it over to his own desk. And he was the kind of guy I had noticed him before, the way he would swagger. He was like looking for trouble all the time. And and so when he took when he did that bold thing of taking the book off my desk and bringing it over to his desk, I, I said, hmm, wait a minute, I'm going to stand up for myself. And I, I stood up and walked over to his desk to, to, take, to get my book back. And that just, I don't think he expected that. And so we got into a scuffle that the whole class stood up to, to watch it. it was, so, we, so we made a lot of commotion noise-wise. So the monitor who was out in the hallway, probably right outside the classroom, could hear it and came in and broke it up real quick. So neither one of us heard each other. We were just kind of like wrestling, you know. We never, we never struck each other with any solid punches or anything, but uh, it was, I wasn't proud of it, you know. But I, I didn't want to just let him get away with taking my book, you know. <laughs> I know, book today, lunch money tomorrow. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway. And did, do you remember having any kind of a contentious relationship with him throughout the year, or did you both just sort of ignore each other? We or? both kind of ignored each other. I can't remember much after that. Did you have any black friends in high school? Not necessarily. I did, um, I did have a few acquaintances, and one, was, uh, one black kid, was named, his name was John Oliver, and he seemed like a really nice guy. He, he would get along with some of my other white friends that I chummed around with, um, I think mainly because they were on the football team together. And um, I kind of admired the, the you know, sports and athletes and all that. Um, I tried out for football one year. I said, no, this is not for me. <laughs> Decided tennis was. <laughs> I think it was because what was already there. I think the reason forced busing happened, I think Judge Garrity was the guy who, who put it into law. I'm not sure what they were trying to achieve. They were trying to equity in, in schools for blacks and whites, I think, right? I mean, I'm, I'm 14, 15 years old at the time. So I was just trying to roll with it and trying to make the best of it. Um, so I think it was just pre-existing, you know? I think there was like, um, uh, I'm not sure what, um, what caused it. I mean, racial tensions were always there in the Boston area and still, still are to a degree today. Um, so it's hard to explain. Was the busing designed so that there would be an equal number of white students and black students, exactly equal? I think so. I don't know for sure, but I think so. I heard um, a statistic that South Boston had a certain amount of black kids bust into there and then a certain amount of from Roxbury and then a certain amount of white kids got bussed over to Roxbury in, in, in exchange. It, it was like, a, it, I think it was like an even swap at the time. So, yeah. Oh, so it wasn't just about having an equal number of whites and blacks in the classroom. I think, I think it was trying to, mainly to try to have the black kids who were, who had inferior sc uh, schools come into the white schools to get a better education and, and achieve equality is what I think. Do you feel like you got a good education in high school? Uh, no, not really. Um, the best subject that I benefited from was woodshop, and that, was, that became my chosen career uh, that I still do now at, at this age of my life. And what about other subjects? Do you remember? I liked science. Science did interest me um, I, because I really think good communication is important. I was focused a lot on spelling and English class, English, English class, so I could, you know, read and write well in order to communicate. So I, I took an interest in spelling words correctly and, you know, writing sentences. 
So not all the classes were disrupted all the time. No, no. You could actually. It's probably, you know, every two or three weeks, you know, there'd be a breakout. And then things would settle down. And it was only a matter of time before it happened again. What did your parents think about busing? Mm, they um, just did what was handed to them. You know, these these were like, these are the cards we were dealt, so let's go deal with them. You know, that was the way, that, that was the approach. And it made most sense for me to go to Hyde Park because, like I said, we lived in Mattapan. My parents had bought their first house at the time there. So I could walk down to River Street and take the public bus, uh, the MBTA bus, to over to Hyde Park and, and walk to school. Any other particular memories that come up? Um, I mean, maybe about your woodshop teacher, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mr. Welch. How was Welch. that class? Was that a, a full class? Did a lot of people yeah. participate? Yeah, Mr. Welch was great. I, I, he's the only teacher's name that I can remember because he was this big, broad Scandinavian guy with blonde hair, and he, he made class fun. He would talk loud so everybody could hear him, and he would show, you know, show, show us all how to use the machines and... And our first project was making a jewelry box that I gave to my mom. And uh, I, I just latched on to woodworking like a, like a house of fire and, and just loved it. And was that a racially integrated class? It was. And yeah. people seemed to get along because they liked the teacher? Because yeah. it was so, taught so well? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Were you introverted or extroverted? Oh, introverted. And do you For think sure. that was partly because of the racial tensions in the school, or is that just by nature? By nature. You know, I, I tried to, like, steer clear of trouble whenever I could. Kept, so Kept your head down? Yeah. I think that... I think that some of the, some of the kids in school may have thought that... I was, I might have been gay because I was so introverted, you know, but that's, let's not, let's, <laughs> let's not go there any further. Did you feel targeted though? Did you feel like you might be a target because of all the racial tension and all the violence that you might be a target? I was once on the public bus. There was a kid, Vernon. Vern Don't say his last yeah, name. Yeah, I know, I won't. I can't remember it anyway. There was a black kid on the public bus who, for whatever reason, didn't like the way I looked or something and, and uh, assaulted me on the bus. But um, he, I didn't get hurt much at all. I mean, I just, he, he was like, a, he wasn't a big dude either. He was just like kind of scrawny. <laughs> I was just sitting minding my own business and he like assaulted me. And all I did was like, defend myself. I didn't try to strike back or anything, but uh, it, that got broken up pretty quickly too. But um, it's kind of funny. I seem to remember that after that, he and I had, 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 had made contact after that also, and we kind of looked at each other, and he kind of gave me an apologetic look, I, I seem to remember, that he, wasn't, he didn't feel good about having done that to me, you know. But again, a lot of this was so long ago, and it was such an awful experience. A lot of the memories I just have tucked away and, and, and to purposely forget about them and move on and try to have a more positive outlook. Tell me about the hall monitors. Were those... Some, they were... Were they, they sort of like cops, or were they sort of like teachers, or were they sort of like they fellow were, students? They were undercover cops. As, ah. If I remember right, yeah. And how big was Hyde Park High? Oh, pretty big. Yeah, it was a big building. So how many monitors do you think there were? Pro uh, 
I mean, was there one in every hall? Or Yeah. So yep. a, a huge crew. Yeah, well, they were scattered about... Again, it was so long ago, I'm not, I didn't, can't quite remember exactly. You know, specifics are about all of this are difficult to recall, but the general gist of all of it, I'm trying. <laughs> I read a headline about Hyde Park High while you were there um, in January of 1976 that 1,300 students got into a fight at Hyde Park High at your school. Yeah. So when that was going on, what would you be doing? Um, taking cover, trying to like not be hurt and um, getting out of the building as soon as possible. Um, because at the time, the general neighborhood surrounding area was mostly all white people who lived in the surrounding area of the school. So... All, the cops knew that they needed to get all the white kids out of the building because they knew that they could just walk home. Whenever a fight like that broke out, the cops knew that the thing to do was to get all the white kids out of the building because they knew that they knew they could just walk home because they lived in the immediate area. So that left all the black kids in the school, which probably made them feel like they took over. You know, they won. They, you know, they they now own the building because it seemed well, like either that or they were prisoners. Yeah, but it was, seemed like warfare. You know, it's like I don't think anybody wanted to do this force busing thing with, you know. That's my perception about it. Um, Could you imagine, though, a black family at a terrible school system saying, wow, here's, here's my kid's ticket out. They're going to move to a... I mean, they're going to be bused to a different town for a better educational experience. Mm. Higher grade. But do you think that happened at Hyde Park High? Was it... Did people get good educations there? I, I can only speak for myself. I don't know. <laughs> did you? Maybe some did. Mine wasn't great. I think um, I, the main thing I took out of it was woodworking. Did your siblings go to Hyde Park High? No, they're all older than I am. And um, when I was at junior high school at the Taft, which happens to be right across the street from Brighton High School, that's where my older siblings went, was Brighton Bright. Brighton High School. And that's that's a pretty white area, right? Uh, back then, no. Oh. I think it was mixed back then. But again, I think I was too young to remember. I, all I know is that there, w there was interracial kids at my junior high school, so there must have been uh, over at Brighton, Brighton High, too. How was your social life in high school? <laughs> or junior high. Well, I got introduced to marijuana, so I, I'm, I became kind of a stoner. I got high a lot, and I think that probably had a lot to do with my, with, uh, with things, and. Um, what things? Well, just the way, just the way uh, my life was back then. I hung out with some kids, that, um, that did that, and it was all you know, peer pressure thing. I did enjoy it, and um, it probably probably had an effect on my attention span in school. So you got stoned like in the morning before school, or no, no, not in the mornings. It was probably I at least waited till the afternoons. <laughs> <laughs> so you're stoned for some of your classes. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was a way of you know escaping. The, the reality that was so negative. Did, did it seem unfair that you were put in this situation right when you were, you just had become a teenager? Did it feel unfair to you? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, but it, I think my parents didn't have many, many other choices. You know, I, we were a, a, a lower middle class family. I had uh, 
Um, at the time, I had two older brothers and, and an older sister. And, uh, you know, we just dealt the cards we were... We, we dealt with the cards that we were dealt with. So what messages were you told from older generations? Like, this is going to be a good thing for this, this community, did they say? What did they say to you? You know, that's, that's hard for me to remember. I think that... Um, oh, you mean my parents, or...? Parents, the white community, right? Well, this, this is the law of the land now, so you, you're going to have to just, like deal with it. This is what you have. This is the way it's going to be, you know. Like I said, I, I, I can't really remember a whole lot of specifics. Sorry, but... Um, how about, um, it's a half century later now. How, how does it feel looking back on it now? <laughs> I wish things were different. I w wish things had been different. I think I would have been you know, maybe I would have been, uh, my career could have taken a different turn. I mean, I'm still happy with what I do. You know, I, I always remember people saying, you know, whatever career you choose, you got to do what you love doing. And that's, that has been the truth for me. You know, I get to be creative, work with my hands. Um, I remember I got interested in that early on from my dad who did, did like working with his hands. I, you know, I helped him with maintenance around the house. Um, we actually painted the, the outside of the house together one year. And um, he had a little work, workshop in his basement where he did tandy leather work, you know, stitching wallets and whatnot. And um, so I, I kind of admired that. And I just took up the medium of wood and... Um, and some metal, and uh, got into that field, and it's, it's I'm, I still love it. So back to Hyde Park High. <laughs> um, one line you mentioned to me yesterday was we were all anticipating some kind of conflict. Yeah. Right. It was kind of like all the time. And it made it made, that made it hard to focus on the studies. Um, and whatever, whatever subject it was, you know, it was not easy. Collaborations with other students didn't really happen much. And I, like I said, I can't even remember any other teachers' names except for Mr. Welch at Woodshop. Do you think it was a failed experiment? Yes. So. Yes. Yeah, forcing, I mean, I think that if disintegration was to be attempted... It could have they could have tried a different approach or strategy, like almost like a you know a trial era, a trial period, you know, a trial and error thing. Let's try this out for you know a semester or for a few weeks and see how it goes. Instead of having it be forced upon us and be the law, you know, and start it in '74 and your all four years of my high school years were 74 to 78 and then it continued all the way till 88 right yeah 88 and that was i don't think that was the correct approach because it was it was a volatile environment anyway this whole racism thing um Try it, try it out for a trial period in, in one or two schools that I guess could have been South Boston and Hyde Park or it could have been some other schools, you know, and just see how it goes. I mean, I think they just flung us into it 
and I don't think any of the teachers or administrators were expecting, I don't think they were specially trained for it. I don't think they were expecting what, 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 what came to be. So when it did, when, when all the conflict did happen and the violence and the, and the stabbings and the, and the, it's like, what do you do now? Are you going to keep going with this? I think there is a better understanding, you know. I think um, I'm remembering Barack Obama being being voted in as president was a huge thing. I think that was fantastic, and you know, again, I don't speak much about politi- politics much, but you know, I I listen and hear what's going on and. I, I don't know if America will ever resolve these issues totally. You know, I mean, we can try as we may to make make things better, but in in certain parts of the country, it it, it seems kind of hopeless. You know, this country, we say we're united, but we're really not. And I'm getting a little verklempt about it, but uh, so what are you going to do? <sighs> mm. D- don't do any more forced busing. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, Everybody needs to realize that we're all, we're all pretty much in the same boat. It doesn't matter what color our skin is. You know? All, all the inequities, there has to be some kind of a solution. I don't have it. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure there was. Um, I, I think there was low attendance, yeah. Especially right after a riot. Back then, some, I mean, young students like you. Uh, I remember the riots of 1968, 69, 70, huge racial riots going on. And I lived in New Haven. Boy, did we have some big Black Panther kind of riots. It, it was it was a reality for us, and I can imagine that was a reality in Hyde Park and in, in the busing towns, the Mattapan, or wherever the busing was coming in from, that they kind of grew up with these kids grew up with the idea that when something's wrong, you have a riot, you have a violent riot. Right. So that might be also just part of their uh, landscape. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Right. So you have another question? Well, <laughs> why don't you talk a little bit more about any particular memories that you have from high school? 
whether they're good or bad, whether they're a friend, whether it has to do with music or some other thing, and especially if there was anything integrated about it. But uh-huh. um, I just tried to roll with it. I tried to get through it without, you know, being seriously injured and try to try to get benefit some sort of education from it. Um, did you go to the sports games? You were saying that you admired some guy's football yeah. abilities. Mm-hmm. Was that a, a racially mixed event in the audience and in the on the teams? Was that a, a place where people got along? Yeah. Um, I can't remember actually going to any games. Um, I think I may have... Um, again, this specifically, those kinds of things kind of have been so pushed into the past for me that I just decided to move on. How about your tennis team? Was that integrated? Tennis, tennis was fun. It was, it was integrated. It was, there wasn't a whole lot of members on the team, and, and overall we were pretty terrible, but... <laughs> <laughs> But I think I might have been the best player on the team, but not to not to brag or anything. But I, I it, it's a game that I really enjoyed playing even after high school. You know, I can remember working with uh, playing with a coworker on a on a weekly basis. We would meet on once a week, and and we were at the same level. And the more we played, the more we progressed at the same rate. Well, back to the high school team, though. Yeah. Did you have, were you friends with some of the kids regardless of uh, whether they were white or black? Or Yeah, we chatted. We had like, I mean, we didn't become close friends or anything. But, um, the, but there was a nice feeling. Yeah, yeah, because we were both doing something that was fun and we enjoyed together. So yeah, that was good. And did you go to any dances or music events? No, music music wasn't really part of my life then. I mean, I would just listening to music, but da- live music and dancing not so much. I mean, I I can remember trying to get permission to go see Jeg Isles open up for Led Zeppelin at the Boston Garden. My parents would not let me go <laughs> cuz they, <laughs> they, they <laughs> I I so wanted to go to that show and they wouldn't let me. So I was listening. And you would still pay to go to that show. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, that was, it, it was, for me, it was Jay Giles, Aerosmith, Led Zeppelin. Those were my, that was, those are the bands that I loved. Did those experiences of being in mixed spaces open you up to uh, mixed race relationships going forward? No, not really. It was kind of like blacks and whites tried, purposely tried to avoid each other. You know, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that, but that's kind of like the way it was. That was the environment, you know, that was the atmosphere that was created or it just, you know, was always there. It just spilled into my generation. Well, do you feel like that people felt more safe, like whites felt more safe sticking with whites and blacks felt more safe sticking with blacks. Yeah, yeah, it was that kind of thing. And then whenever I saw Run DMC get together with Aerosmith and do Walk This Way, I was like, okay, this that's something cool. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. How how has that expressed itself in your life? Like, what missed opportunities do you think you missed out on? Ah, <sighs> hmm. Looking back, it's hard to say, but all I can say now is that I have a great relationship with with a black drummer in the band that I play rub board with. So. If you're going to play rub board with any band, you got to make a connection with the drummer and the bass player, who's also black too. And we have such a blast together these days. It's so much fun. 
it really just changes your whole body chemistry, you know? It takes you out of the normal routine that you have day to day, to day and it just brings so much joy to not myself, but I see other people who are, you know, in the crowd dancing, and it's just fantastic. <laughs> it's Cajun Zydeco Blues, Americana Roots music. Huh? Say the name. Oh, they're called the Squeeze Box Stompers. And there's an elite lead accordion player, there's a saxophone player, there's a fiddle player, a uh, great guitar player. And um, it's so much fun. Um, we, have a, we actually have a CD release party this coming Friday night up at the Me and The Coffee House in Marblehead. If I could throw a pitch in there <laughs> um, we get going and it's like it's like nothing else it's so much fun Barbara and I oh, you know they'll play a waltz they, on their new CD they, call, they have a song called the Cranberry Waltz and I don't play rub board in that but I, I get out on the dance floor and Barbara and I will go waltzing around the dance floor Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like uh, you've uh, opened up a closed treasure chest in your heart from these high school years. Yeah. What about you two? Is there anything about your relationship that you guys want to get on the record? <sighs> yeah, come to my yoga class. <laughs> <laughs> In Cambridge. But is there anything about your guys' personal relationship that you want to say or want to remember? Uh, well, we, uh, back when, uh, probably it was like six, six years ago, seven years ago, we decided to adopt a dog, which we love. Her name's Cha-Cha. We name her after the dance. <laughs> um... And we have a really happy life together living in Watertown. We just had uh, some family members visit us last night um, and had uh, like a picnic out on the back porch and little kids running around chasing balls. And uh, that's always fun. Yeah, and we love living in the Boston area because there's so much music and art and just a certain kind of freedom that we've, we both value. We work for ourselves, and we can do that yeah. here. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of sporty stuff that we do, ride bikes and hike and kayak. swim, kayak. Yeah, we've got the river everywhere. Our little dog fits in our tandem kayak with us. She never goes in the water, though. No, but she loves being in the boat. Yeah. You know, the winters are trying to boot me out. Yeah. I really would love to at least have a place for a month in a warm place in January. Yeah. But other than that, I'm too close with my family to want to be too far away. Yeah, same here. My, my immediate family is different, but... Yeah, he's, my family has adopted him. Yeah. So my my siblings fully. and I, we, we've, we've splintered apart ever since our parents passed away. But you're part of ours. Yeah. I know, right? You had some closing questions, right? Make them easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, these aren't, you know, how does your desegregation experience shape who you are today? Well, is one of them. I'm happy with who I am. Um, yeah, I could have had a better, better education that could have made, made me take a different trajectory, but I don't really have any regrets. I mean... It is what it, it, it is what it, it was what it was, the whole 
era of my high school years. Um, but I got through it relatively unscathed. <laughs> my take for you is you have a first-class brain, and it took you a long time to sort of fill in the holes that high school didn't give you. Yeah. The, the, your education had huge holes in it, and the things you were interested in you pursued yeah. as an adult, and you filled them in yourself. But it was really a shame that I feel like you got half an education. Right. And then... You made up for it. Give or take, yeah. 